New York Times op-ed, Professor Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Zedblatt argue the greatest threat to our democracy is not from former President Trump or his extremist followers who stormed the Capitol, but rather from the ordinary politicians, many of them inside the Capitol that day, who protect and enable them. Professors of government at Harvard University join us now. They are the authors of the New York Times bestseller, How Democracies Die. And now they're out with a follow up on the dangers they say cause democracy to unravel. It's titled Tyranny of the Minority. Guys, good morning. Welcome back. Good to see you. Good morning. So, um, Stephen, let me start with you about the op ed, which is the enablers which is some of the people we've been talking about just this morning. Speaker Kevin McCarthy, perhaps most prominent among them, going along for the ride with Donald Trump on issues that used to be absolute disqualifiers, not just for Republicans, but for anybody. You steal nuclear secrets, bring them back to your beach club, game over. You try to stage a coup against the United States government, overturn an election, game over. And yet, a small minority of the party, we just had Governor Christie and Governor Hutchinson on, they're the only two in this primary field speaking out against Donald Trump and they're pulling down the low single digits. So what is this moment right now as you both see it in the Republican Party? Look, studying democracies and crises of democracies all over the world, in Europe, in Latin America, elsewhere, it's very clear that there are three elements to, um, to committed democratic politicians. Democratic politicians must do three things. They have to always accept the results of elections, win or lose. They have to always denounce uh, and refrain from political violence. And crucially, they have to always break from, denounce, try to hold accountable anyone who engages in anti-democratic behavior. And on that third front, there are a set of politicians who look like mainstream politicians. They dress like mainstream politicians. They talk like mainstream politicians, but they, they violate that third tenet. They remain quiet, or maybe they justify or condone or protect groups or politicians who engage in anti-democratic behavior. And looking at history, looking at Germany and Italy and Spain and Chile and other places where democracy has broken down, it's precisely because mainstream political parties, mainstream politicians refuse to break with anti-democratic extremists. And that's what really worries us today in the Republican Party. Is it just, Daniel, about power? Is it just that Kevin McCarthy wants to keep his job? He knows these things are all bad, all these crimes that Donald Trump is alleged to have committed. And when asked about it, he says, well, yeah, but what about Hunter Biden? He, he can't defend a lot of the stuff we've seen, especially lately, but he changes the subject. Is it just fear of the voters? Is it fear of losing his job? I think it's all of those things. And it's often, it's just careerism. I mean, it, it, to be a careerist and to think about, you know, your future in politics is normal. That's part of democratic politics. But when democracy is at stake, you have to draw a hard line. And, and one of the points that we draw in our book is that if you look throughout history, it's, you know, there's often attacks on Congresses and parliaments. The question is, how do mainstream politicians respond to that? Do they denounce it or do they just look out for their narrow, narrow self-interest? And when they do that, ultimately, democracy gets into trouble. So, Daniel, let's... Go a little further here, then. It's, it's one thing to enable Donald Trump right now as he's a presidential candidate. What happens, though, were he to win? What would that say about where this uh, country is as an American experiment and its democracy going forward? Yeah, frightening, frightening. I mean, you know, we've just seen in the last several days the rhetoric that candidate Trump is using. It's even worse than 2016, saying he will, you know, uh, indict his opponent without any uh, basis. I mean, he's explicitly saying that. And so I think the broader point, though, has to be that we have to think about why are we in this situation? Why is the United States in this situation? And even if things maybe feel OK some days, we have to kind of step back and say, you know, America is vulnerable to these dynamics. And if not in 2024, you know, in 2028, unless we address the underlying issues plaguing our democracy. Mika? So, um, Stephen, Daniel was talking about the uh, careerists like Kevin McCarthy, but how does an entire, I mean, do you look at how an entire party becomes complicit in anti-democratic behavior and behavior that is completely in opposition to what they believe? How does that happen? It's, uh, it's, it's happened rather quickly. Um, in, the, in the case of the cult? United States. No, no, it's not a cult. I mean, I think, first of all, there, there was a transformation of the Republican Party over the last 40 or 50 years as, as America grew more diverse 
the Republican Party got stuck and, and didn't and reached a point in the particularly in the early 21st century where it was having trouble competing nationally in elections. And that radicalized the party. But it's important to, to point out that our institutions are in some ways making the problem worse. Because of the, uh, uh, the bias in our electoral institutions, Republicans are able to win national power, either in the Electoral College, also in the Senate, without winning national majorities. If the Republican Party had to win national majorities to win elections, it would be a less radical party. They would, party leaders would be under much less pressure, or much more pressure, to reach out to a broader set of the electorate. And I think we'd have a, a less of a problem today. Daniel, can I follow up on that? Because that's what I was going to ask. Isn't this as much a systemic problem as anything? You say that you've studied democracies in other Western countries and you don't have this situation where the minority, whether, you know, through the Supreme Court, through the Electoral College, through the fact that uh, districts are brought, brought, uh, drawn up by politicians rather than by civil service, and so you get the gerrymandering that you get, and you just get a, a situation in which the, the organs of government, if you like, on big issues like gun control or abortion don't re represent the majority of the country anymore. You are the only democracy in the world where someone can lose the popular vote and yet become president. I mean, that's striking if you pause and think about that for a moment. And that's only indicative of a broader problem, exactly as you say, in the Senate and the Supreme Court. And so what all of this means is that if a party can win power without winning majorities, then it won't try to re win, out, uh, win those majorities. And if you think back to other democracies around the world, or even in our own history, you know, when the Democratic Party was out of power through the 1980s, after losing a series of elections, the, the, uh, Bill Clinton regrouped. He came up with a new ideology, new faces, that the uh, British Labor Party, after many years in the wilderness, Tony Blair remade the Labour Party. What parties are supposed to do when they lose is to revamp themselves and try to figure out strategies to win over majorities. That's not hop happening today in the United States with the Republican Party. And that's due, we think, to our, in part to our institutions. And so, you know, really a way forward is to think about how do we change our institutions in a way to encourage the Republican Party to behave in ways that are absolutely critical for our democracy.